Forbes Books presents Sustainable Leadership and Disruptive Growth with David Radlow. Transformation for a new and better world. Here's David. Thanks for joining me for the conclusion of my conversation with Steve Killoy. We've been talking about his global philanthropic efforts and why he was inspired to create the Global Peace Index, a quantitative measurement of global peacefulness. Steve, a recent best-selling book by Bill O'Reilly, Killing the Killers, details allied efforts to root out evil against terrorism for the benefit of peace. How important do you see military missions as a positive deterrent force in waging peace in the modern era that affects the Peace Index? Well, I think they're really uh, uh, critical. So it's obviously uh, in some some areas the uh, military operations are, uh, can be criticised, and quite often there are good reasons for criticism. But look, if you've got a, got an Islamic militants, you're not going to uh, 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 defeat them unless you've got strong military force. So, for example, the country with the biggest improvement last year was Mozambique. In Africa and that was because of the combined efforts of the Rwandan Defence Forces, a, a, the a, uh, African Development Association and the Mozambique Army and so if you don't fight them uh, they're just going to grow in strength so there's a definite need to fight them but what's I think really clear from the research we've done with the Global Terrorism Index is how long do we terrorist groups exist and what's really interesting 80% of them are a, a, a cease within the first three years but once they get over seven years it's very very hard to root them out because by that time they're embedded in local communities they've got local support so it gets exceptionally difficult so really what you need is you need the military operations quite often in the very very early days of these groups but in the long run, the military operations won't be enough. They can knock them and suppress them. In the long run, what you've got to do is address a whole range of other issues, which might be your, your, your social inequities. That may take the form of group grievances. It can be politically uh, yeah, state terror on its citizens. Uh, that can be another reason. So there's all, quite often it can development. If you can get the right levels of development, people see their lives improving. That helps. So if you come back and you start thinking about Africa with two thirds of uh, the people food insecure, and then you get down to uh, the Sahel, for example, where it's even much worse. People are going to join militias if they just think they're going to get food to eat and get a full belly. Uh, so you've got developmental issues you need to address. And quite often with the governments, there's very, very weak governance, uh, a lot of corruption. So you really need to be able to address those things uh, as well. So when you're looking at it, what I'm saying is a lot of these terrorism, like a lot of conflict issues, is systemic. We also find that most terrorist attacks are associated with conflict. So if we go back over the last decade, for example, the number of the terrorist attacks which happen in conjunction with the war ranges from 92 to 97% in any one year. Where do you see global terrorism coming out of the pandemic? And what were the pandemic effects on what you're seeing going forward? We're coming out of the back end of COVID. There's all sorts of effects we can see. Obviously, China, I think, is one thing we've got to watch going forward is they've got a zero uh, COVID policy in, in many ways, particularly with some of the Omicron variant of COVID. It's going to be very, very hard for to control it. We've just seen Shanghai go through a lockdown. That's the largest port in the world. Do you realise in the month of April in Shanghai, not one car was sold? Not one car, not one new car. And that gives you an idea of just how strong the lockdowns are. So as China struggles with all that, that will create weak economic growth, but it also has a whole lot of impact on supply chains. So as we move forward and you get further outbreaks in China, which inevitably are most likely to occur, we're going to get further of these supply chain issues. And so that's going to have a real impact going on. We've also noticed that the supply chain issues, they just don't have issues with, let's say, us buying new cars. They have issues with food supplies as well. And so we're seeing 
food prices increased because of the, uh, the COVID supply chain issues. And obviously Ukraine's going to fuel that on even further. Now, all this has knock-on effects in a whole range of other ways. So the first one's inflation. And we can see inflation now rising. And there's no end in sight to how far inflation's going to increase because we've still got a lot of issues around the supply of basic goods, particularly fuel products and food. And then we're also seeing issues around just basics, the supply of all sorts of different commodities that you will manufactured goods into a whole range of different countries as well. As interest rates rise, that's going to, the world's got to record levels of debt. So last time I had a look at a gross debt, and that's not net debt, gross debt was 246% of global GDP. So if interest rates rise, the servicing of those debts becomes a, a, a more expensive, which will come back and crip cripple a uh, economic growth. So these aren't good scenarios I'm talking about at the moment. So I think the next few years is going to be tough. That will come back and play back into a uh, levels of the uh, peace. So for example, uh, and I may have already mentioned it, but for example, uh, we've got some of the indicators like political instability, for example, state sponsored terror, there's another one. They're at record levels since we've been doing the Global Peace Index, and I think we're going to see them uh, uh, deteriorate even further in the future. Violent demonstrations is at near record levels as well. And so I think with the next couple of years, it's probably not going to be good for global peace as we move through this uh, rather difficult period. Would you be kind enough to comment on the work the United Nations does but really, you're the expert on this. Do they have the ability to bring about peace and act effectively against a force and the spread of violence? Or are they a bunch of noisy nobodies, as Professor Henry Delfiner of Tufts University used to say, and just a bunch of waste of money? I think UN does a lot of good. So I'm, in some ways, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of UN. In other ways, it drives me crazy. Uh, so I'll, I'll hit both sides of it, David. So I'm somewhere in the middle, I guess. So look, one of the things we don't see is just through having the United Nations, a, countries have back channels to talk. So there'd be all sorts of, the, with the Ukraine, there'd be all sorts of back channels going on there for discussion, uh, which would revolve around the UN. And these things we don't, we don't ever see. See, one of the other things too, with conflict, it's an event. We can actually see it. But when anything happens which is for peace, it's a non-event because nothing happened. But so the, quite often the things which work, the things we never see. The UN also has, like, let's say, uh, with refugees, UNHCR, they do a good job there uh, looking after a, a global refugees. There's 84 million of them now, and they're going to be growing uh, even more with coming out of the, uh, the Ukraine war because the numbers will pick up yet again, probably be within another 12 months, be at least 90 million, I think, globally, which, which is a lot. So that's more than double what it was a decade ago, just to put it in perspective. Now, there's other things the UN does which people don't realize like standards bodies like the seat belts in your car the baby seats in your car the signs on your road when you drive down and you see are standardized all around the world and so there's a whole lot of standards which come out which get created out of various bodies as well now in other areas the bureaucracy and the inefficiency is mind-blowing mind-blowing Unless you really start to deal with it, it's a very, very hard to see. Uh, so, for example, we can see sometimes just getting a sign-off on a, a simple thing like a report can take months, where if it's a private company, it'd take days. And so I think sort of there's a need, real need for the restructure of the UN. Uh, a lot of people would say the UN Security Council doesn't work. And that's because the permanent members of the Security Council and the structure of it. Uh, but restructuring it is very, very difficult. Very, very difficult. Uh, also, I think uh, votes in the, in the General Assembly quite often can be bought. 
that's the that's also an issue in terms of the governance but the world's an imperfect world many governments are imperfect as well and so I think with the UN you've got all these uh, imperfections coming together but on the other hand if you didn't have it the situation would probably be worse but again there's a lot of in it which is a uh, bureaucratic highly bureaucratic and a lot of it which is highly inefficient in your book peace in the age of chaos you talk about creating the concept called positive peace what is positive peace and it was published in October 2020 which could be easily described as the year of chaos could you let us know why the book is so important yeah, well, it's interesting. I coined the uh, name of the book, Peace in the Age of Chaos, uh, uh, before uh, uh, COVID. And now I look at it now, and particularly as we can see the knock-on effects from COVID and from the Ukraine war and what the next few years are likely to be like, it was uh, really aptly named. So let's take a look at positive peace. So positive peace, the definition is the attitude, institutions, and structures which create and sustain peaceful societies. Now, how do we arrive at positive peace? And this is, this is the brilliance of this piece of work. See, I've got the Global Peace Index. Uh, down here in Sydney, we've got about 26,000 different data sets, indexes, attitudinal surveys, which we've got in a normalized manner, which we can then use mathematical modeling, statistical analysis against the Global Peace Index to understand what are the factors most associated with highly peaceful societies or associated with peaceful societies. And so now, once we've isolated what they are, we then get rid of uh, things which are duplicates. And that breaks down into eight different pillars, which we call the pillars of positive peace. And so that means that's great. We now know what creates for a highly peaceful society. But what's more profound is when we take this and we can put this around into another index called the positive peace index now once we've done that we've now got the ability to be able to see the velocity or the movement of societies where the underlying structures are creating a something which is more peaceful or a society which is less peaceful but what's really blew us away once we'd done that we then started to look at this positive peace index and started to see what other factors were associated uh, with positive peace for when it improved so what we find is that the, when you're looking at countries which improve in positive peace compared to countries which deteriorate in positive peace the gdp growth rates two percent per annum higher and that's a large in extra increase in gdp their interest rates are less volatile, as is their inflation rates. In fact, you've got four times less validity in the inflation rates than the, what you have with countries which are deteriorating in positive peace. You find that they perform better on measures of ecological performance. So countries which are improving in positive peace are much better. Much better on measures of well-being and happiness. Much better on measures of inclusion. So from that, we can see that positive peace actually describes an optimal environment for human potential to flourish. Now, why is positive peace important? So we went and looked at, let's say, the Western democracies in the world, and none of this will come as a surprise to your listeners, but democracies on the decline. Uh, people are uh, finding it uh, less uh, able to meet with a lot of the demands which are coming out of society today. And we can see that things like uh, real wages in many countries for many segments of the population are falling. Uh, perceptions, and I'll reiterate, perceptions of corruption in Western democracies are increasing. And there's a range of other issues as well. We find group grievances uh, on the rise. We also find fractionalised elites. That's, a, that's where the elites within a society are fighting more amongst themselves. That's an on an increase as well. So where positive peace is high within societies, these, these effects are muted, uh, they're lessened. 
So therefore, if you're focusing on positive peace as a mechanism to be able to reinvigorate Western societies, it gives us a way of being able to try and transform our societies, make them more functional, ones which have got higher productivity and ones which are more fulfilling for, for citizens. Therefore, what we'd say is positive peace describes an optimal environment for human potential to flourish. And I think that's transformational given the age we're in at the moment and the issues which I've already described, which we're likely to see in the next two years. We need a new way of being able to think about our Western democracies. We need new ways of being able to think about how to invigorate it. And positive peace, I think, is an excellent candidate. Tell me about your argument, evolution is more effective than revolution. What do you mean by that? What we use is a lot of the systems, the uh, theory in the work which we do. So now, if you're looking at it from that angle, societies are on what you call path dependent. So if you look at it, that's the values you've got within society. It's the history of the society. It's the uh, you learned memories of the society. And so by evolution, with the systems, what we believe is you need, if you want to change the direction of a system, you need many, many small nudges than rather one big revolutionary nudge. And so that's a lot less likely to have failure for the system. So if it's small nudges, if any of them don't work, well, you, they have, won't have done too much damage and they're easy to undo. If you take one big change within a system or revolutionise it, really fast. Once the system's changed, you can't go back to where you were. And there's a lot more risk in terms of failure. So that's why we use the concept of the evolution rather than revolution. When you take a look at prioritizing ecological threats, peace, sustainability and development, can it be done all at the same time? Yes, this gets back to we're looking at the concept of systems. So what's important is to be able to uh, study a, a, a society from a systems perspective. And that's a very, very different way of being able to look at it than the way we look at societies today. We tend to look at the uh, uh, cause and effect mainly within society. So we'd say, here's a problem. What was the cause? Let's fix the cause. And, and therefore it'll change. But systems are very, very different. And it probably haven't got enough time to get into it. But the first thing is systems have a steady state. They're always trying, a bit like our bodies, they're always trying to seek a steady state. So you've got all these checks and balances in a system to bring it back to a steady state. And that's not that systems don't evolve over time, but you've got what's a, titled encoded norms, which try and keep that steady state. So also you've got what's termed mutual feedback loops. So what happens is the uh, something happens within the system, it creates an output, it goes back and it alters, it alters the input. So the input responds differently. So an example of that would be, let's say, think of two political parties. One puts out a manifesto, the other one now attacks that manifesto and responds to it. The first political party now adjusts. And so you see these kind of uh, things happening through society, uh, uh, continually in all sorts of different ways. It's like we're having a conversation now. Uh, you'll ask me a question, I'll make a response. That comes back and adjusts your a, a mental context. So the next time you ask a question, it'll be different. So in cause and effect, quite often it springs out of a physical understanding of the world. And so if we look at physics, this is one of the things why empiricism has been so profoundly good is the effect doesn't influence the cause. That's a bit like throwing a ball up in the air and catching it. So when the systems, each, if you like, each event is very, very different. So what you need to do is not study so much the uh, event. You want to understand the, the relationships and flows because the events just come out of the relationships and flows. And so I think when you're looking at all of this, this is how you can start to bring together a whole range of different things like economic development, uh, uh, the economy, uh, governance, ecological threats, and conflict. 
You say you're not an optimist nor a pessimist. Is it fair to characterize you, the man who brought real practical measurement to world peace and terrorism? Are those tied together? Yeah, well, I don't know if I'm a, 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 a get asked this question a lot actually, Dave, but I don't know if I'm really an optimist or a pessimist. Most people see me as an optimist. I, I know that. They see me as a fairly, got a positive sort of nature. But I'm more situational. It depends depends what I'm looking at. So things like climate change, I think will get it solved. I think the technology advancements there today, uh, they're there. They're, they're, it's an, it's a, 20 years from now, it'll be a no-brainer. A, a coal and coal-fired power stations and such will disappear. We'll be shifted over to electric cars and such. So I'm pretty confident on that. Ecological degradation, uh, not so not so sure on that. That's a, like the loss of species is really a worry. It's very hard for us to actually understand how that's actually going to impact us. But that's 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 a, I think a, a real issue is the just the ecological degradation we've got going on the planet. Uh, certainly, there's too many people on the planet for the, uh, the amount of resources which we're consuming today. That comes back and affects economic models. If I look going forward for the next couple of years uh, around the economy, a uh, uh, level of debt, inflation, I'm fairly pessimistic on that. But if I look at decade ahead, I'd be fairly optimistic that we'll get back onto a, 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 the right trajectory. I think conflict, if we're looking at over a long period of time, I think it's positive, it's, it's becoming less. I think one of the offs offshoots of the Ukrainian war at the moment is that we, what we can see is that conflict doesn't work. So if we look at it now, we can see Russia lost in Afghanistan. We saw the US lost, lose in Afghanistan. We also saw it lose in Iraq. And now we're watching Russia fail in the Ukraine. So if the population doesn't want the invaders there, and they've got an adequate supply of arms. It's very, very hard to invade. And even if Russia did invade the Ukraine at the moment, what you'd find is that there'd be a counter, a, a, an asymmetric war with a counterinsurgency movement, which it'd be just like the US struck in Iraq and Afghanistan. So I think many, many countries now are seeing that war is doesn't actually work. And in fact, what's be surprising for most of your listeners, if we went back over the last decade, more countries have, become, have decreased their militarization and increased it by a large number. Something like the 163 countries in the Global Peace Index, 110 of them have decreased the number of armed, armed service personnel. And if we looked at the number of countries which decrease their military expenditure as a percentage of GDP, that's something like 90 of the 163 countries in the Global Peace Index. So I think most countries are realising uh, that wars are re destructive on their own economies and very, very difficult to win. Yeah, Steve, you've been a full-time philanthropist in the 90s. You've been nominated twice for the Nobel Peace Prize. What do you want your legacy to be? Yeah, well, I guess I don't really think too much about my personal legacy uh, because, like, let's face it, when you're dead, you're dead. What I do want is I hope that the output of the activities of my life have some positive impact on life. And so I think for me, that's uh, that, that's incredibly important. And I think... I think in the book I use a piece in the Age of Chaos, I use an analogy there. So if we can think of life as a tapestry, a beautiful tapestry, do we want to be remembered as someone who went to it with a, a golden thread and a silver needle? Or do we want to be remembered as someone who took to it with a pair of scissors? I think we'd all like to be remembered in the first category. And I guess in a uh, life and in terms of a legacy, I just hope it has a positive impact. That's all. You have various tools, including books, wall charts, reports on peace, terrorism, and more. Care to comment on them, how they can help organizations and people assess the world 
and care to explain and tell us how listeners can get them and learn more? Sure. So we've got a number of websites people can go to. So the first is visionofhumanity.org. Uh, the second is economicsandpeace.org, but Vision of Humanity is where we keep most of the data for the uh, for people if they're interested in, in what we've got. So we've got a number of the interactive maps there where they can see the state of world peace, so look at it from many different angles, like positive peace, you can see it from the Global Terrorism Index, from the ecological perspective or from the perspective of the Global Peace Index. We've also got a whole range of other things which we've got as well. Uh, so, for example, you could go and do a, an academy on positive peace, an online academy. It's a simple one, about three to four hours to do, but gives you a very clear understanding of positive peace and the relationships between peace and economic development. That would be another example of things we can do. If people are more interested and want to step it up from there. We do a uh, got an, amb an IEP ambassador program, uh, and so that's sort of a more intensive training, and that runs over about four four sessions and requires sort of uh, some project work as well. Currently, got about four thousand people trained on that. Recently, trained a couple of hundred people in Ethiopia and another four hundred in Nigeria. So there'd be another thing you could do. We've got Facebook pages, we've got Twitter feeds. So we've got a whole range of different ways of communicating our information and people can get at all of that. And that's really through visionofhumanity.org. That'll be your best way of being able to get onto them. You'll find the various feeds there, which are pretty easy to get at. We'll go into Facebook and just Global Peace Index, just do a search on that and you'll find it. Well, Steve, thank you very much. I can't thank enough as we take a real great deep dive into everything about war peace economics and what's important in the world oh well thanks david i've really enjoyed being on the show and look forward to the next time to connect with david go to davidradlow.com David's book set, The Principles of Cartel Disruption and Secret Stories of Leadership, Growth, and Innovation, are available wherever books are sold. This has been Sustainable Leadership and Disruptive Growth with David Radlow, a presentation of Forbes Books.